Good evening. I'm now going to be sharing with you Inside the Passion, the book forward is written by Mel Gibson. The writer was his friend, Father John Bartonek, who was involved in the um, film The Passion of the Christ, made by Mel Gibson. The title of this chapter, chapter 9, is Christ's Final Words. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Michael Archangel, defend me in this day of battle. Be my safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, I humbly pray. And do thy Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust down to hell, Satan, and all the wicked evil spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Christ's Final Words Spotlighting Forgiveness Christ talks more during the crucifixion than he does at any other time in the film. The flashbacks include his longest lines, except those in Gethsemane. And from the cross he speaks what Christian tradition has long referred to as the seven last words. These statements are found in the New Testament and each one is considered a seminal testimony to the meaning of Christ's passion. As the film portrays, it would not have been easy for Jesus to speak at all under those circumstances. So each phrase mattered the filmmakers sure to include all seven, not adding or subtracting. Well, there was one addition, according to the Gospel accounts. All the seven words seem to have been uttered from Jesus on the cross. But the film has Jesus speaking, the first one. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. While they are still nailing him to the cross, he cannot get the first line, the whole line out, because he is writhing in such pain. And because Jim Caviezel, was having difficulty with last minute script changes that day, the actor who played Jesus. He can still, but he can still say more than once. They do not know. They do not know. Why is he shown saying this line before the cross was elevated? The obvious answer is that Christ would have been saying that phrase the whole time, during the whole length of the Passion. The entire point of the sacrifice is so that sins can be forgiven. The same line, the full version, also appears when Jesus is dying on the cross. Caiaphas challenges him to show some kind of sign that he really is the Messiah and then walks off in righteous disgust that someone so pitiful could claim to be the promised one of God. As he walks away, Jesus again says the first of the seven words. Father, forgive them, 
for they know not what they do. Why include that line twice? It is important to realise that God's forgiveness is being enacted at the very moment when they are torturing and condemning him. That is what the passion is all about. It is the revelation of God's love, which in turn is the source of Christian faith and hope. Forgiveness ties it all together. By featuring the line twice, the film depicts two different kinds of forgiveness. While being nailed to the cross, Jesus forgives those who are responsible for his physical torment. When he is hanging from the cross, he forgives those guilty of moral violence, those who are rejecting his person and message, who are publicly humiliating him. Jesus greatly suffered the consequences of both genres of sin. It was necessary to show both dimensions of his forgiveness. When Caiaphas hears Jesus' response, he stops dead in his tracks. He slowly turns, looks at Jesus with amazement as the screenplay elaborates. It is a critical moment the first time anything Jesus has said or done has penetrated Caiaphas' heart or even made any kind of impression on him at all. It is a glimmer of hope for Caiaphas, sparked by a word of forgiveness. Dismas the thief, hanging on Jesus' left, notices the exchange and is moved to start a dialogue that will lead to the second of the seven words. He says to Caiaphas, as if in rebuke, Listen, he prays for you. It is a sign of Dismas' moral awakening. This criminal has been watching Jesus the whole time, drinking in his every look and gesture. The love exhibited by Christ's self-sacrifice has penetrated this thief's heart in a way that it has not yet penetrated Caiaphas, who, for the first time in the film, is left speechless. Or Gesmas, the other thief. Dismas responds to the love he has witnessed by making an act of faith, reaching out to Jesus with a prayer of humble hope. Lord, remember me when thou shalt come into thy kingdom. Jesus grants his prayer. Amen, I say to thee, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Only these two lines, the prayer and the response, are recorded in the Gospels. The rest of the dialogue is interpolation though based on scriptural allusions. Everyone in Jerusalem during those days had heard of Jesus and what he had been doing. 
Dismas was certainly no exception. He too knew that Christ had entered the city less than a week before. Amid acclamations of praise and exultation, but it was not such abstract knowledge that was able to renew his heart, seeing Jesus hanging on the cross, forgiving the very enemies who had mutilated him beyond recognition and even praying for them. That is what converted him. That was the kind of saviour he could relate to, the kind of God he could pray to. A Christ like that inspires hope. The next title, The Hungry Crow. This tentative emergence of goodness and hope is interrupted by the rude cackle of Gesmas, who, unlike Dismas, simply cannot see anything special about this Galilean weakling. As his malice boils, a crow perches on his cross. In Christian iconography, crows symbolises death and sometimes damnation. The crow pecks out Gesma's eye. Was that scene added? Was that added scene to Hollywood, as some viewers thought? Not necessarily. The idea came from the documented research of real crucifixions. The criminals would hang there dying for days. Birds would rip their rotting putrid flesh even before they were dead. Swarms of flies would infest their wounds. This is what crucifixion was like. The film could not show an entire five days of agony, but it needed to communicate that aspect of the horror. The event also bears a spiritual significance. From the first time you see Gesmas, you detect something diabolical about him. It is as if the devil has entered into him and is tormenting him from inside. The appearance of the crow is not something simplistic like a punishment. The devil was operating through this man, attracting horrible things to him. Excuse me, I do have a terrible cold and it hasn't disappeared and it's annoying. Sorry, I do apologise. <laughs> From the 25th of March, I still have it. The viewer sees the encounter unfolding cinematically and cannot help being drawn into it as it is. This artistic interpretation also works well theologically since the punishment for sins in the Christian tradition of spirituality is neither random nor generic. Sin is a purposeful deviation from the wonderful wise plan of the Creator. The goal of that plan is human happiness on earth for a little while and then forever in heaven. Therefore, the natural consequence of deviating from that plan is missing the goal, missing out on happiness or on some aspect of it. If you are greedy or slothful or lustful, for instance, the result will be suffering associated with greed, slothfulness, or lust. The consequence naturally fits the crime. Gesmas closed his heart and mind to Christ, refusing to see 
the love Jesus' passion revealed. The crow pecks out his eye as a symbol of the spiritual blindness that was his undoing. I thirst as life ebbs out of the crucified Jesus. Mary and John come close to the cross, drawn by his love to accompany him more intimately during his last moments. When they approach, he forces out the third of the seven words. I thirst. The Gospels record that the guards overheard him and held up a sponge soaked in cheap wine or vinegar on the end of a hyssop stick to Jesus' lips. That little drink of vinegar also fulfilled an Old Testament prophecy. The Gospels record that Christ's crucifixion began around noon and his dead body was taken down three or four hours later. The last time he would have drunk anything would have been at the Last Supper. Considering his overwhelming blood loss from the beatings and flagellation and the physical exhaustion of the forced march with the cross to Calvary, under the hot sun, Jesus' thirst must have been severe. But thirst is an odd type of suffering. It is physical, but hidden. As Jesus hangs on the cross, his torn flesh rubbing against the rough grain of the wooden cross, his head and brow pierced with thorns, his hands and feet throbbing from the nails. It seems curious that Jesus does not complain about any of those excruciating pains. Instead, he mentions only being thirsty. In one sense, nothing could be done to alleviate the monumental pain of that point whereas Jesus could still take a drink to relieve his parched throat. Christian tradition has always been seen another meaning included in those words. However, just as Jesus called to mind the suffering of physical thirst, Christians believe he was simultaneously bringing to light another hidden suffering, that of spiritual thirst, the thirst unrequited love. God did not have to send a saviour to fallen humanity, and yet he did, Christians believe. Why? Why? Out of love. In the early chapters of his Gospel, St. John summarises the entire message of Christianity in one simple but amazing phrase. For God so loved the world as to give his only Son, that whosoever believeth in him may not perish, but may have everlasting, life everlasting. God wants to save sinners. He wants to welcome them back into his friendship by forgiving their sins and renewing the trust in their hearts. He thirsts to give them back authentic meaning and unquenchable hope. When Jesus gasps, I thirst, 
it points to more than his burning desire for a drink. It reveals the even more ardent desire for hearts, for the reciprocal love of those he loves so deeply. The next title is The Mother's Hour. At that point, Mary can no longer watch, only in silence. She speaks her heart, reminding Jesus of the deep union between them by calling him, Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, Heart of my heart. It is more than mere poetry, since she is truly his mother. Then she explains with wonderful conciseness the depth of her suffering as she stands by, helplessly watching her son die. My son, let me die with you. He has been the entire meaning of her life, naturally and supernaturally. Without him to care for and to follow, she will have nothing left to live for. With him suffering so horribly, she cannot bear suffering any less. These words are not recorded in scripture according to the biblical account. Mary does not speak at all at the foot of the cross. The screenplay adds her words to help explain the meaning of the words of Christ. Christ speaks in response. He looks into her eyes. Again, the actor Jim Caviezel is almost miraculously able to exude consummate spiritual strength in the midst of absolute physical debility and then looks at John. The lone representative of his inner circle of disciples and gives Mary a job to do. Woman, behold your son. Looking at John, he further explains son. The word son is not pronounced at that point in the gospel account. Behold your mother. It is the moment when Mary, who brought Jesus into the world and is now with him as he leaves this world, is given to be the spiritual mother of all the Christian faithful. Jesus will not let her die with him because she has more work to do. Her mission is not over. She will have to mother the infant Christian church once Christ has returned to his father, just as she mothered Christ himself when he first came from the father. At the beginning of the sequence, Mary's weight of suffering seems to increase, almost anticipating the mission she is to receive. She staggers forward toward the cross, leaning against it and kissing Jesus' feet, her lips reddened with his blood. Like each of us, Mary must renew her hope, 
at the fountain of lasting spiritual strength. The inexhaustible love of Christ, symbolised by his blood and made tangible in the bottomless suffering of his passion. The next title, Finishing the Job. Christ's final three phases reflect intimately what is going on in his mind and heart as his sacrifice nears its climax. Most of the spectators have returned to the city and the atmosphere of loneliness is accented by Gesma's harsh taunt to Jesus. They're running away, abandoning you. You're alone, there's no one left. No one! The words echo. The tempter's words Jesus heard at the start of the Passion in the Garden of Gethsemane, suggesting a final attack on his trust in the Father. Now that his suffering has reached its fullness, Jesus' response seems at first to be indeed a final break in his confidence. He lifts his head and cries in desperation, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How can he have gone through so much? up to this point and kept his faith and now suddenly rebel against his father, question his father's love. He did not. The Gospels record this prayer, which seems at first glance to be a cry of rebellion and despair. In fact, however, it is a line from the Psalms it activates the meaning of the psalm as a whole by pronouncing the first verse of Psalm 21. Jesus is engaging the entire psalm to express the prayer of his heart at that moment as he hangs dying on the cross rebuilding the bridge of trust between mankind and God that original sin had destroyed. The psalm shows that Christ's faith was not breaking as he cried aloud. Instead, his faith was taking its last triumphant lap through his path of blood and humiliation. Although his suffering was extreme, his love was more extreme, just as in the text of the psalm. Psalm 21 summarises the reason behind Christ's passion and the fruits it will bear for the salvation of sinners in a new, everlasting kingdom. Christians have always considered it one of the most eloquent prophecies of Christ's passion. It was written by King David around the year 1000 BC. Although it is long, it is well worth reading as it provides a jarring glimpse into the Messiah's heart as he hangs on the cross about to die. O oh God, my God, look upon me. Why hast thou forsaken me? Far from my salvation are the words of my sins. O oh my God, I shall cry by day, and thou wilt not hear, and by night it shall not be reputed as folly in me. But thou dwellest in the holy place, the praise of Israel. In thee have our fathers hoped, they have hoped, and thou hast delivered them. They cried to thee, and they were saved. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I'm a worm and no man, the reproach of men and the outcast of the people. All they that saw me have laughed me to scorn. They've spoken with lips and wagged the head. He hoped in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him save him. 
seeing he delighteth in him. For thou art he that hast drawn me out of the womb, my hope from the breasts of my mother. I was cast upon thee from the womb, from my mother's womb thou art my God. Depart not from me, for tribulation is very near, for there is none to help me. Many calves have surrounded me, fat bulls have besieged me, have opened their mouths against me. As a lion ravening and roaring, I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are scattered. My heart is become like wax, melting in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue hath cleaved to my jaws, and thou hast brought me down into the dust of death. For many dogs have encompassed me. The counsel of the malignant hath besieged me. They have dug my hands and feet. They have numbered all my bones. And they have looked and stared upon me. They parted my garments amongst them. And upon my vesture they cast lots. But thou, O Lord, remove not thy help to a distance from me. Look towards my defence. Deliver O oh God, my soul, from this sword, my only one, from the hand of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, and my lowness from the horns of the unicorn. I will declare thy name to my brethren in the midst of the church. Will I praise thee, yet that fear of the Lord praise him. All ye, the seed of Jacob, glorify him. Let all the seed of Israel fear him, because he hath not slighted nor despised the supplication of the poor man, neither hath he turned away his face from me. And when I cried to him, he heard me. With these my praise in a great church, I will pay my vows in the sight of them that fear him. The poor shall eat and shall be filled, and they shall praise the Lord. They that seek him, their hearts shall live for ever and ever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and shall be converted to the Lord. And all the kindreds of the Gentiles shall adore in his sight for the kingdom of the Lord, and he shall have dominion over the nations. All the fat ones of the earth have eaten and have adored. All they that go down to the earth shall fall before him, and to him my soul shall live, and my seed shall serve him. There shall be declared to the Lord a generation to come and the heavens shall show forth his justice to a people that shall be born, which the Lord hath made. Having fulfilled all the prophecies, having drained the chalice of suffering to its last bitter dregs, and having parried the devil's final thrust, with a glorious flourish of trust. Christ knows he has finished his work. Catching his mother's eyes, as if to include her in his triumph, he pronounces the final report on his earthly mission of salvation, the mission foretold from the dawn of history and prepared for since the fall. It is accomplished.